Um, so we are in Matthew, and if you notice, with uh, that's a good one, Barry, I like that. Um, if you notice, it's more than a reason for a season. The, the reason for that is we're in Matthew 1, and some of you are going to be shocked that we're allowed to even do a message in Matthew 1, uh, and it's not Christmas. But we are, and I want to um, tell you, without trying to be humorous at all, that I almost, and I know this is weird, but this is how deeply indoctrinated we are in the Western world, and I'm swimming in the same waters without realizing that I'm actually wet, is I thought, oh, maybe we'll just skip um, the whole Christmas part, because that's, what? The, the one commitment we made in here, we're just going to go through um, the writings, we're going to study the apostles, thank you, and so to skip something just seems uh, stupid, doesn't it? So we're going to go ahead and hop into this thing, but I would challenge you that as we're reading through what you've only typically heard given at Christmas time, that you actually allow yourself to maybe hear it for the first time in a, a fresh environment, and then if I'm not any good at it, show back up for Christmas, because it will be better. All right, so there are 26 genealogies in the Bible, that's what I was told, I did not count them, I just did what you guys did to make sure I'm right or wrong, you Googled it, right? Um, 26 genealogies in the Bible, and we discussed last week that ancient genealogies, well, they prioritize different things than we do in the Western world. That in the Western world, it can be summed up with, uh, I used from, was it Dragnet? Just the facts, ma'am. Right? Was that Dragnet? That's, that's what we want. And so we absolutely, well, I should say this, whenever you hear someone talk about all the mistakes in Scripture, you need to dig deeper and look at their background, because if they're a Westerner, if they're someone on this side of the Enlightenment, for those of your history buffs, I can tell you they're looking at it different than the person who was writing it. That as a Westerner, we think you have to get everything correct. It has to be the names. Don't skip a generation. Just the facts, ma'am. But instead, what we discuss, just to kind of give a background we're launching into today, we discussed that ancient genealogies were conveying multiple layers of information, and they were often used to make theological claims, both inside Scripture and outside Scripture, because as it turns out, um, these were Jewish individuals writing to a Jewish audience, and nowhere is that more evident than in the book of Matthew. It's the most um, heavily Jewish book of all of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and we see this idea of genealogies conveying multiple layers of information. We see this at play at the very beginning of Matthew's account of Jesus in this Gospel of Matthew. And he begins with this statement in Matthew 1, 1, where he says, The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the son of Abraham, the son of David, the Messiah. And there's these claims that he's making already that the Jewish individual would have had often visceral responses to that we lack. We think we're just studying, oh, we're studying the Bible today, something far and distant. This is deeply personal to a Jewish first century individual. This culminates in a lifetime of promises that they were heard, that the God himself, Yahweh, who revealed only to them this personal relationship that he had made. And now Matthew is saying, well, it's been fulfilled. This is a big deal. The first is son of Abraham. Abraham is the father of Israel. But even just to say that is not to convey all of, as I would say, the visceral response, all of the emotions that would have been elicited in a first century Jewish individual. And I don't know, maybe that's even true today if you're a Jewish individual. I don't know. I, I'll be very um, upfront. I do not know any practicing Jews that I can go to and talk about. I just I talk to you about this stuff. I rely on the same information as you guys, but I do know that in the first century, just the very name of Abraham would have elicited tremendous emotional responses because Abraham wasn't just a person. Abraham wasn't just a name. Abraham would have conveyed the very moment in history, in all of human history, when God himself chose a nation, chose Israel, and, and, and I would say again, um, and I said it, said it last week, and I'll say it again for those of you interested in such things. I made the joke today that for those of you who want me to speak about the issues of the Middle East, the Hamas and Israel, the Palestinian, all this, I don't speak to that specific, but guess what? If you're listening to this today, you're going to pick up on the fact that, that 
you'll know more about why this is happening at the end of this, but this is not about that. But this is about when Abraham was known by God. And God made a covenant with Abraham that he would bless the entire world through the lineage of Abraham. And this moment is so momentous. This moment, with all of its ramifications, are so vast that, like I said, they continue to play out on the entire world stage. That the entire human history, if you want to get down deep into it, has been impacted by God's choice to choose the nation of Israel as his people. That you can see that vastness, but also that this consequence of that choice actually is so personal that it's played out right here in Sweet Home, Oregon, far removed from the world stage. So I thought, we're going to look at it. I thought, let's just look at this covenant that God made with Abraham. And for those of you who uh, are smarter than me, you already know that this covenant is played out in many different areas, beginning in Genesis, and there's many different things I could pull. So give me some grace on just the ones that I pulled that I think would encapsulate most, most, but I can't, given the time frame and where we want to accomplish today, I can't get it all, but I'll just say this. Let's look, first of all, at this covenant as it's revealed in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. This is God talking to Abraham, and he promises to bring about one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And he took Abraham outside, and he said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Is that one through three? Oh, that's 15. Uh, okay, we got it. Four B through five. Go to Genesis 18, 19. I didn't correct my notes after I sent you the slides. So go to the next one. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. The one I will bring from your lineage I have chosen that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Is that it? Because again, my notes kind of get switched around. So this is the beginning of this covenant. And all you need to know, it says, well, that doesn't seem that deep. It's God promising to bring about an heir of Abraham that he is going to use to reveal himself and his righteousness to the world. That this household will be extended and God will be known to the world. And this is the beginning of a relationship he made with Israel. That's all you need to know. This is the beginning of a relationship he made with Israel. And this relationship was so personal that God used the context of a husband knowing his bride. The intimacy, the physical sexual intimacy that's contained within a marriage of commitment and devotion that more than just a spiritual, excuse me, a physical act occurs, but it's deeply spiritual as Paul talks about. This knowing someone in such a way, God says, I am the husband and, and Israel was his bride. But the story continues, and this is the story of the Old Testament in many ways. You see, Israel was unfaithful. Israel was unfaithful. Again, God said, I'm your husband. He's going to use this context. You are my bride. And if you're thinking in terms of also, this continues into even the New Testament. When Jesus says, I am the groom and my church is my bride. This covenant continues, but here are the origins of this thing. Israel was unfaithful. They turn to other gods. This is the story. And throughout the Old Testament, this is what gets me. Whenever anybody says things like, well, the Old Testament is just a God of vengeance and justice, and he just hates everybody, you don't know what you're talking about because you haven't read the Old Testament. You don't understand because the Old Testament is just filled throughout the Old Testament through the voices of the prophets. You hear God's pain. You do. You hear his heartbreak. And I'm going to say, for all of you who have spouses who have turned away, you hear his anger. Anger is appropriate in such a thing. And God, did all the kids leave? All right. You guys all say you want me biblically accurate, right? Yeah, God likens Israel to a harlot. He calls her a whore. He calls her a whore for, for being unfaithful. You realize, I learned this many years ago when I was teaching a Bible class somewhere, that if I were to actually um, teach it the way it's represented, I would have been fired in the first week as I taught Old Testament. Do you understand that? 
That the pain that God felt, the words, the, these things were real. This isn't some pie in the sky. He said, I've chosen you. I've made this intimate relationship with you and only you. And then Israel turns to other gods. People say this, they go, I don't like it when God is called a jealous God. And I'm like, well, you're an idiot then, because here's the truth. The truth of it is, even as a father, and we've said this, if you've heard me do this, I've done this for a long time because it hit. If my daughter started to go to somebody else's house and call him dad, began to go over all the time, he's my dad, he's my, I would have a response and I would be jealous over the affection that my child was lavishing upon another man. And I can tell you that if my wife made the same decision or I made the same decision, there would be appropriate jealousy. There would be appropriate anger. There would be hurt. And this is articulated throughout the story of Israel, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament. It's articulated as God's entire heart is laid bare. His hurt, his pain, yeah, his anger, but also his love. Also God's love and his commitment to Israel, and nowhere is this made more clear. And if you came today and you're like going to be disappointed that we have a lot of Scripture we're looking at, I'm sorry, we're going to have a lot of Scripture. Nowhere is this made more clear than the life of a prophet called by God. His name was Hosea. And he's told to marry a woman. Who, who knows the name of the woman? It's a beautiful name. It brings and elicits, already today, it's so poetic, and it elicits the best of femininity, beauty, Gomer. <laughs> Thanks. I, I was going to keep going until somebody, but the setup was going to be long. But look what God tells Hosea, his prophet, to do in Hosea 1 and 2, I believe. The Lord began to speak through Hosea. The Lord said to him, go marry, and I like this, a promiscuous woman. She's a harlot. She's a professionally promiscuous woman. Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. Do you understand when he says have children with her, he means become intimate in a way. Be, love her, commit to her, give your body, give yourself to this woman. Make a marriage commitment to her. Have children for like an adulterous wife. This land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. Can you imagine Hosea going, um, can I just tell him that? Can I just bring it up? It didn't work. You see, the, the, the prophets spoke deeply for God. And so this is what he called him to do, to go marry a harlot, for everyone to see. I can't believe Hosea married Gomer. All the talking about it, all the scandal that would come from a Jewish prophet, a man claiming to be God, Yahweh's representative, to marry a whore. Someone everybody knew was... Well, he tells him to do it, to love her, to care for her, to protect her, to fully commit to her, but she does something. She leaves Hosea, and she goes back to work. She becomes a promiscuous woman in the professional sense. And I can understand then, Hosea, if you read through Hosea, you can get a sense of probably going, well, what did you think was going to happen? You had me marry someone, this is what she does for a living, but thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, because I can tell you this. If you want to fall in love with your, your bride, you want to fall back in love with your husband, you do what Hosea did. You act like you love them. You go ahead and you serve them. You do the things that you used to do when you, didn't, when you were courting them, when you were committed to them, because your body will respond by loving them. Do you understand that? In fact, I can tell them, some of you guys, if you want to fall back in love with your spouse, do the things you used to do. I cannot promise they will fall back in love with you, though which is why most people won't commit to it, because now the pain will be double. And that's what Hosea probably comes out with. He goes, I did it all. And dang it, now I like her. Now she's gone. Well, at least now I can move on, right? Because surely God wouldn't put him back in a difficult circumstance. Well, so God says, hey, Hosea, what I want for you to do now is I want you to go pursue Gomer. I want you to find her. I want you to court her. And I want you to, and this tells you how far she's fallen. I want you to do what you have to do to reclaim her, which is what, guys? 
by her. At personal cost to yourself, you now have to go, I'm calling you to go get your bride back that you made commitments to, and at personal cost to yourself, you must purchase her back. And I certainly hope you can see the prophecy actually pointing toward Christ. I certainly hope I don't have to draw this thing out at great personal cost, purchasing those who have been unfaithful, but God's commitment to fulfilling his promise as it's perfectly played out in Hosea, this covenant he made to Abraham, this covenant he made to Israel, it continues to manifest itself throughout the entire Old Testament. But it's actually, and this is why you need, my first gig, my, my, my professional training is actually in the books of prophecy of the Old Testament. And I would tell you, at the time I thought, man, that's boring. Why is this the stuff you're calling me to go learn? And I can tell you now that that's actually the very best way I could have done it to actually learn about the promises of God first and then to see how they're fulfilled. And so God's promises, God's, uh, his commitment, well, you see them continue to manifest throughout the entire Old Testament through the lives, through the words, and through the very actions of the prophets that he's called to speak his heart. And it's often done in ways that we in the business we actually debate them whether or not they even knew they were saying a prophecy. Is that okay? That they don't even know sometimes. I'm, this, I land, this is my opinion. I land on the side of sometimes these prophets didn't know that what they were even saying and doing, God was going to use in a different fashion than then simply talking about it. But other people would say they're divinely inspired, they understand all of it, doesn't matter. Here we have this in Isaiah the book of Isaiah is, I believe the law, is it, uh, Bob, is the book of Isaiah the biggest book of the Bible? Six, it's 66 chapters. Yes, it is. Let me ask somebody who knows what they're talking about. Um, <laughs> Psalms is more bigger? I'm so proud of all of you guys. You didn't realize that was a setup. <laughs> Bob, I knew you had it all along. You're my go-to guy. But is the book of Isaiah big? Bob, is it? It's big, right? Can we agree it's a large book? (laughs) Isaiah was uh, God's prophet, and he at one point was serving God in the palace of King Ahaz. And as you go through the books of the Old Testament, um, they're actually enumerated which kings are good kings and which kings are bad kings. And the kings that are good kings, it's not a matter of their civil record, although I'm sure in some cases it actually is. It mentions the things they did as they turned back to God, but it's literally, were they those that pursued God and were those who abandoned God? Ahaz is placed firmly in the camp of not a good, not a good king, and he is being besieged by outside forces. And what's interesting for some of you, that the things I'm talking about are actually contained and written in cuneiform, that we can find them in hieroglyphics, that we can actually find them in other areas around that talking about, and we laid siege to Jerusalem, that we went after this king. And we're seeing it from the inside. They're looking at it from the outside, history, archaeology, at all the tests. This stuff is true, that we get to be dropped right down in the middle of what was going on in the land of those making the decisions, which is King Ahaz. So Isaiah goes to him, and he's there, and Ahaz is is told to ask for a sign. Ahaz is told, ask for a sign that God will actually defend you. Ask for a sign that God will fulfill his promises. But Ahaz actually refuses, and we could go into that because it's not a sign of virtue. It's a sign of arrogance in this context. So Isaiah tells Ahaz this, and this is in Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel is a word that means what? God with us. God with us. And now there's all kinds of things and arguments, again, within the scholarly community about this, but I can say this with a high degree of certainty, much more so than I was a minute ago about Isaiah and Psalms. Often with an Old Testament prophecy, there is a now and later aspect to it. There's a now and later occurrence, and this seems to be true in this Old Testament prophecy that he may not have even realized he was giving a later version of it. 
The word translated as a virgin here, and this is a big deal, but I'll allow you guys to just let the Holy Spirit kind of go where I'm going with this, take you there. The word that's translated as virgin has a dual meaning to it. Young woman also. Also, not instead of, do you understand? Also. So most scholars associate the initial fulfillment of this prophecy that he gave to King Ahaz to be the birth of a child to Isaiah's young wife during the siege in the reign of Ahaz. That would be the initial. Do I know this for a fact? I'm simply going with what most scholars would say was the initial fulfillment, that he had a child born to his wife who was young, and this was a sign during the siege. But there, see, there came from this a Jewish belief, a Jewish belief that the other meaning of this word Virgin, as it's translated here, this other version, this other version of the word meaning virgin, I just came up with that, that was clever, actually had a later fulfillment. There came from this a Jewish belief that there would be a virgin birth, which would result in what? Emmanuel. It would result in what? God with us. And I say all of that. That's a lot of a runway just to get to a takeoff, just to say this. Matthew was not writing to a Western audience. He was not creating a Christian doctrine, as we're going to see, of a virgin birth. This isn't something he came up with, with to fill in the blanks. He was writing to Jewish believers who had long associated a virgin birth with what? God with us. Emmanuel. And so Matthew begins his introduction of Jesus again by stating that he, and now we're back to the beginning, that Jesus was the long-awaited son of Abraham. He's the fulfillment of all of God's promise in this Abrahamic covenant he made, that the chosen one that we saw would send, and there's more, I could have went deep into this thing, that the chosen one sent by God to fulfill the promise God made to Abraham has occurred, Matthew is saying, with the birth of Jesus. He goes on to say, and we didn't get into this enough, that he is the rightful heir to the throne of David, that only he is qualified to sit on the Davidic throne. And then here comes the Christmas story. Then Matthew, did I say something offensive? Because there's a mass exodus occurring out there. If you guys need a reason for that, just get out. There's the offensive thing. Matthew writes this, Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child. Two things. Uh, the legal process of she is my wife has begun with the betrothal. Do you understand that? Okay. Second thing is, came together before they had sex, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, plan to send her away secretly. We hear this all the time at Christmas, right? Joseph had a normal response. He's like, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what? <laughs> You're telling me that you haven't had sex with anybody, but you have a baby? I'm sorry, what? It's, it's God's? Sounds good, right? Let's go, let's go with that, Mary, right? But he doesn't want to actually have her killed, which could have been the outcome, had he claimed unfaithfulness, her unfaithfulness, so, when he had considered this, putting her away, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, which means, not God with us, it means Yahweh saves which I'm going to just say, Yahweh saves because he came to be with us. How is he going to save us? By being with us. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. What prophet? Bob, in the second longest book in the Old Testament. <laughs> Behold, the virgin shall be with child... And shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. Which translated means God with us. And Joseph, 
woke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and they called his name Jesus, which means Yahweh saves. And I say all this about a keep, God is with us now. God with us. The promise is fulfilled through Jesus, who is Yahweh, who will save us. Matthew writes all this, that God had fulfilled his promise spoken by the prophet Isaiah. God had fulfilled his promise. This is what Matthew is conveying. It's not a genealogy. It's not for us to debate this or that. We don't like how he left out this or that. His purpose is God has now fulfilled his promise spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Meaning this, Emmanuel, God with us, is actually now with us. And his name is Joshua. Josh, Yeshua which means he will save us. The last of the Gospels to be written was written by, I believe, and I don't want to ask Bob because he'll tell me the truth, but <laughs> Bob wasn't the only disciple to die a natural death, John. Yeah. Nailed it! All right? Got it. The last of the Gospels to be written was John, and consider this. I love the fact that John would have written, read everything that had been written about Jesus. It had all come across. It's all out there. He's seen it all. Then they come to him and they say, with your passing, no one who knew him will be around. Write it down. I can remember when my mother was doing that with uh, your parents, son and Detsy. I can remember you were trying to write stuff down. Do I, did I imagine that, or was that not uh, an effort you took at one point? It's true which is going to be worthless to any of us because her handwriting is so bad. <laughs> That's so good. Um, but you can understand why at John's old age they were coming and saying, please write it down. You're the last one. Write this down. And so when you read John, you need to read it in not just the text, but the context. That he's not trying to repeat. This is another thing they say. Well, it doesn't repeat. It's not. You're such a Western American person. He's not trying to say everything that's already out there. He's trying to be personal. He's trying to say, this is what I know about my best friend. This is what I know about how Yahweh revealed himself, not just to the world, but to me. And so he begins, John does, this gospel with actually um, what is considered to be, by people who are not even scholars, some of the most beautiful literature ever penned by a human hand, which is the first chapter of John. So look at John 1, whatever I have written down again. I, I went back, so I'm not so sure. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, he was in the beginning with God. Do I have more from John? Thank you. And the word became flesh. And the word became flesh. And he dwelt among us. He set up his tabernacle, it says. He tabernacled among us. And we saw his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. And this is how John ends it. How can I describe my friend? How can I describe as I'm setting up how God revealed himself? How can I say how Emmanuel, God, was with us? And how is Jesus going to save? What is it? How can... Guys, he was full of what? Grace and truth. And I gave a whole message, and some of us need to realize that there's an and in the middle of it. That we don't try to resolve this tension of grace and truth as believers. We live in the tension of grace and truth. This is amazing stuff. There's all these prophecies within a prophecy. The Messiah would come, and now he was with us. God, according to John, he was with us. He had set up his tabernacle in flesh. Do you realize that where the tabernacle was in the Exodus, whose spirit would come and dwell within this tent? God's spirit would dwell within this tabernacle. I've said this before, man's place, God's space coming together. The way it came together in the garden, the way he would come, man's place, God's space would come together and they would walk 
in the tabernacle when they were leaving and they were heading out for 40 years. They were wandering. This is where man's place and God's space would come together. Then they created the temple. And within the Holy of Holies was what? Where God's space, man's place came together. And then Jesus, a man in flesh and God's spirit, God in flesh. I don't want it to get weird because I will absolutely teach heresy unintentionally if I try to explain what just happened with God and Jesus. But can we agree it was the absolute man's place, God's space coming together. And then he goes to the cross. And at the moment it is finished the temple veil goes and it rips, saying that God will no longer be separated from his people ever. They will have access to the Holy of Holy, God Shekinah, his spirit. And then later, the Holy Spirit comes down and he enters into his people. And we become God's space, man's place where it intertwines. It's why your grandmother was correct for all the wrong reasons when she said, you are the temple of God. She meant it, don't get a tattoo, don't smoke, don't chew, or go out with girls who do. What he is saying is, those of us who carry God's spirit within us, we carry heaven everywhere we go. We are God's place and man's space come together. But that's not even my message. But this is the fulfillment, ultimately, that we'll see in Matthew of the prophecy. He is simply saying at this point in the introduction that Jesus, God in flesh, is now with his people... Jesus, Yahweh saves. And even that, like I said, even that points to God's promise that will be ultimately fulfilled on the cross and the resurrection. But let's go back to this Davidic covenant. As a pastor, I do two things a lot of. In fact, hello, Adam says, I'm glad to see you and, and we're not celebrating someone's passing. Right? Half the time I only see people, in fact, I had somebody say this the other day, a good friend of mine said, I'm so sick of seeing you. I thought, <laughs> Whatever happened, right? Whatever happened to hello? But only, yeah, they've only seen me at funerals and stuff. As a pastor, I do so many funerals, but I'm also good at weddings. In fact, uh, Luke and Karma. Uh, <laughs> Luke and Karma are getting married when, Luke? May 25th. May 25th. Where at? The church, Glenn and Shauna's church property. Many people within the church are coming together to make sure this should be done. A community uh, helps you do this thing and gets you on the right foot. And uh, so you gave me a list of people that you wanted to say that aren't welcome. Let me start. <laughs> Is that, did I miss? Right. <laughs> we're going to start alphabetically. And it's weird because we didn't know the Adamses were going to be here. Um, uh, Here's what they said. Here's what they said. Um, they said that everybody, everybody at LifePoint who's a part of this thing is welcome on the 25th. Yeah. At the, at Glenn and Shauna's property where we do church on the river. They would love to share uh, their commitment with this church as they begin this thing. This is their community, right? That's pretty cool. So now you can say it. Yay! Yay! <laughs> but at most, huh? At 1 o'clock. Uh, oh, we haven't met yet. I'm supposed to counsel you. Yeah, so sorry. We'll do that. Um, I've been busy. Uh, when I do these weddings, what used to be, I see a trend, and my wife is a wedding coordinator type of person, and she's seen trends. One of the things I saw early on was there was always a sand um, uh, ceremony. Sand ceremonies were big, and then there was another that was big, and stuff kept going, and, and then I actually did one where they had met at Dutch Brothers, so... <laughs> So they mixed their favorite drinks to create an original drink. Yeah, okay. Um, but what nobody really that I talk to ever really realizes, these are all simply echoes of the covenant. These are echoes of a covenant. In the ancient world, there was, there was a covenant you would enter into. It's a binding agreement. It's a binding agreement. And this covenant wasn't just a Jewish thing. You find it throughout the ancient world. And what would happen was two parties who made an agreement would split an animal. Hey, in fact, I'm having an idea for your wedding. <laughs> Didn't you just have a cow or a calf or something? Or maybe a cat you want to? Okay. But they would split an animal and they would literally tear it apart. And then both individuals would walk through the entrails. Uh, yeah, some of you guys are like, oh, I'm 
Yeah, you talk about a commitment. Because the commitment wasn't to walk through it. The commitment you were saying was, may the same be done to me if I break the covenant. Yeah, but it meant something, didn't it? It meant something. The same fate would befall the offending party should one break the covenant. So I want to go back to the moment God made a covenant with Abraham, with Israel. And you do realize that we have been grafted onto the vine, correct? That his promises given to Israel have now fell upon us. Abraham asked God, again, how can I know? How can I know that, that you're going to deliver on this thing? And again, to me, that expresses the intimate personal knowledge of God that he had. That he can go, I, I'm having a hard time with this. I'm, I'm a thousand years, I don't know how old he was, he was in his old age. He's too old to have a kid, they don't have a kid, so it's going to fall to someone who's not even of his own, his own uh, lineage. And God's like, no, I'm going to do this for you. you. You can believe in me. And so God seals this covenant in the way that he would have been familiar with. Look at uh, Genesis 15, and here we go. He said, O Lord, O God, how may I know that I will possess it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him, and he cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, Know for certain these things. It came about when the sun had set that it was very dark. And behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying these things. Did you guys notice something that happened there at the end? So there's this covenant made between two parties. And I shared with you that when a covenant was made between two parties, they would pass through the entrails and say, the reason you can believe this will happen is if I break this thing, may this occur to me. You can believe this thing because we both pass through this covenant. Did you guys see, though? Did you hear? And I apologize, but now we're back on. I said, did you notice something strange about this covenant ceremony? You didn't notice it, did you? Only God passed through. What's the significance of such a thing? This is huge. What's the significance of God saying, Abraham, I'm going to put you to sleep? This is how you're going to know. You're going to know that I will fulfill every promise I have ever made to you, that I am going to deliver everything to you that I said, that your generations and generations, and he talked about other stuff in there that you might have picked up on, but that's not the point of today for this, what Matthew is saying, and all of this comes down to this. The reason you can understand, the reason you can believe all of this is because my promises and my fulfillment and the delivery of them upon your life and into your life has nothing to do with your righteousness. It is based entirely upon my faithfulness. Do you understand the significance of that? Amen. There is nothing, he said. And then you see, they do nothing. This is like, this is the covenant of a marriage when you say, it's on me. It's not on you. Can you imagine if both people were to say in a marriage, it's on me, it's not on you? Can you imagine the heart of God in this being? It's as insane. You see this thing. It's not based upon Israel's righteousness. It is going to be based upon God's faithfulness. And as you move through the Old Testament, you see this covenant, the same covenant. It's present in the Mosaic Law. You see it in the covenant God makes with David, God's promise to him, this Davidic covenant. You see it in its fulfillment, the coming of the Messiah, the chosen son of Abraham, the rightful heir to the kingdom of David. You guys know the Christmas story, right? Joseph was going to divorce Mary, but an angel appeared to him, and I didn't wear a watch, so this is so freeing. Go ahead. And put up Matthew, again, 18 through 25, but I'm going to highlight what I want to have. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Jesus or Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, 
being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, he planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, take it off, and here's what I need to know. You see, we all have read that. I've read that for years, that the angel of the Lord was, he was allaying Joseph's concerns about Mary's faithfulness. And as I read through it in this context, this has nothing to do with Mary's faithfulness. The angel, and I think I have this one up. Did I not put this one? This has nothing to do with the faithfulness. The angel was not commenting on the faithfulness of Mary, but rather on the faithfulness of of God. It's a continuation of his promise to you and I that we would be blessed. That he, despite everything that Israel had done, despite anything you and I will do, God will fulfill his promises. The angel that night was not communicating to Joseph the faithfulness of Mary. He was communicating the faithfulness of God, that God was now with us that everything he had promised. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is at hand. If you're waiting for something to happen, it's happened. God's fulfilled promise, he is with us. Jesus saves us. We can be sure, even today, of God delivering upon his promises. We can be certain, because like Abraham, it is not based upon our righteousness, but God's faithfulness. And so here's what I want you to consider today. I didn't end it, because I wanted to end it today. I want you guys to consider in your life how much focus you have on your ability or your inability or someone in your life, in a relationship, their ability or inability to bring about what you want and what you feel, what you crave. That's the way we're taught, isn't it? We're taught, Rick, aren't we taught, well, I guess, you know, I'm never going to become something because I don't have it, or I'll never be happy because she's not this way, or I don't get this because my son, but how much do we put on everybody else in our life, right? What if instead we believe God's promises of freedom? What if we believe that he can break these chains, what if we believe that the very things that hold us down, God himself has promised he can deliver us from? Amen. And what if then we believe, what if we believe that it has nothing to do with me and so I can take my eyes off of my failings, off of what I've done to screw my life up, and I can say every day, mercies are new every day. Every morning, and I can get up today and go, I know I've screwed everything up, but God, it is not what I have done. It is because of what you have done yes. that I have faith that you will continue to do it. And I, and you guys know this, I'm just a Baptist boy. I just believe with all my heart that if we pursue Christ above everything else, everything else will be delivered us that Christ has promised. Yes. Because Christ is God, Emmanuel with us, and he came to save us. God's promises in our life today, as you leave here, are not going to be based upon your feelings, but upon God's faithfulness. What God can deliver into your life are not going to be based upon, and I will say this, let me be very clear. Some of our actions put a cap on what God is able to give us, do they not? Our actions and our choices will put a spiritual cap on what can come into my life and into my household. But I can tell you this, if you think that God desires to give you um, something different because of what you have done in your life. I am going to call you out right now. And if you think I just came up with this, this is, I've hit my, hey, um, um, where are my friends back there? Kyle. Kyle, you back there? I can't see. There's the light off your head. There you are. <laughs> when I met with you and your bride, and uh, we were meeting and counseling, and I was so tender and caring. Yeah. Spoke the truth, didn't I? From the very first time we, we met, I, I spoke the harsh truth to both of you. But I also said something to you that you could hold on to God's promises regardless of. And I went to your home, obviously, the first time years ago. I go there all the time now. Um, but you have it on a plaque on the wall, don't you? Could you say loudly, 
What I told you guys as you were talking about all the stuff that you brought into this new relationship, I said God has what? God has no plan B. His, his plan A is to bless you. His plan A is to love you more than you love your own children. Can you believe that? More than you love your own kids. Everything about you, no matter what you've done, he is still going to work out Romans 8, 28, for we know that all things work out for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Called according to his purpose, love him. We play a role in this, don't we? We must pursue him. We must follow him. And he rushes to fill it in because he has no plan B. He wants to bless us.